Okay, this is Baltimore City uh, Council Budget and Appropriations Committee. We are here for legislative oversight, LO 19-0060, budget oversight hearing for Baltimore City Police Department. I'm City Councilman Eric Costello from the 11th District, Chair of the Committee, joined to my left by Councilman Leon Pinkett, uh, 7th District Vice Chair of the Committee, uh, and to his left, uh, Councilwoman Danielle McRae, 2nd District, a member of the committee, and then to my right, uh, Council Vice President Sharon Green Middleton, 6th District, member of the committee, and Councilman Chris Burnett, 8th uh, District. We're also joined to my immediate right uh, by Marguerite Curran, and we are joined by Nina Themelis, uh, representing Mayor Jack Young, and uh, Kaylin Young, representing Council President Brandon Scott. Uh, Commissioner Harrison, please take it away. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and thank you for giving us an opportunity to talk about some of the progress that we're making. One of the most significant ways that we can demonstrate that the department is operating in a more efficient manner is through our overtime spending. On the chart, you will see that our overtime spending has continued to trend downward and stay under budget. In the past pay period, we spent $1.41 million in overtime, which is a 15%, which is 15% less than our budget of $1.65 million. My executive team and command staff have been commended and really need to be commended again for their efforts in controlling our overtime spending and using the taxpayer dollar wisely. This monumental change is due to better accountability measures, improved policies, increased training, and better supervision practices. We will continue to need overtime resources to flex the size of our department to properly keep our city safe because we are extremely sh short staffed. However, when overtime is authorized, I'm confident that it's being done so strategically and responsibly. Regarding staffing and recruiting, as of today, we have 2,455 sworn members to include trainees and cadets among our current personnel. Please, please repeat that number, Commissioner, I'm sorry. 2,455 sworn members. Thank you. All right. To include trainees and cadets among our current personnel. Now, with a budgeted strength of 2,661 sworn positions, that leaves 206 sworn vacancies. We are also budgeted for 588 civilian positions, and we currently have 538 non-sworn civilian members, leaving 50 vacancies, and we are actively working to fill them. Mr. Commissioner, um, for those 538 uh, civilian uh, positions, how many of those are sworn officers that are currently in those seats? Do we know that? Um, yeah, uh, we don't know them off the off the top of our head. We can get that data, but for example, in the administrative bureau, there are 36 sworn officers. That includes sergeants and lieutenants. Of those, I think 32 are sergeants or below. But that's just to give you an idea. The compliance bureau, there's some, there are few in PIB, um, and there are obviously some in operations too. But we can get the specific number for you. Okay, and yeah, can we, I guess the department's now split in because you have four deputy commissioners. Mm -hmm. um, can we get a breakdown of the 588, not 38, where the vacancies are, um, how many uh, civilians and how many sworn are in each of those, those positions? Yeah, it gives us about a week or so. We can put that together. Okay, so we'll say uh, next Friday, which would be the 7th? Yeah. Should yeah be Friday, fine. February 7th. Excellent. Okay, if you can send that to me and Councilman Pinkett and, and Marguerite, and we will disseminate that to the rest of the council. I'm curious uh, where we're at in the uh, previous administration, previous police commissioner administration, not to be confused with Mayor, uh, in those efforts with civilianization. There are originally 62, I believe, 62 or 63 uh, budgeted positions to be outsource essentially police officer goes becomes a police officer again and uh, hire for civilian into it I think that we're down to just 12 that are still unfilled does that sound correct Rachel as of last count okay so roughly 50 have been filled of the 62 and now that we have is um, Councilwoman McCrae was talking about the staffing plan is up for comment right now that will inform us going into the second phase of this basically if that makes okay. sense. okay so we've out of those 62 positions in phase one, we've moved 50 of those folks back on the street. I can't say how many have gone exactly on the street as of this moment in time because there is a, there is a time frame where they 
are tra- one is training the other essentially. So okay. Yes. Oh, so some of those fifty may be training their civilian replacement. Exactly. So there's no. So I want. I want to be clear. Earlier last year, when when uh, it may be may have been budget presentation. Even though we had sixty two uh, budgeted positions, they weren't all filled by police officers. There were some filled by police officers, and some were vacant. Right. At okay. the moment. So they weren't. So it's not 62 police officers that were filling 62 positions. Okay. So 62 positions of those 62 positions, we believe that we, we at moved. least 50 sworn bodies have, have either been moved to the field or are in the process of being moved once they complete training. I think what the commissioner is saying is that of the 62, we don't know. I don't know here tonight how many of those were actually filled positions by officers. I'll find out that number for you. It could be 40. It could be 50. I don't remember off the top of my head, but it would be not accurate to say 50 officers have gone back to the street because I don't know if it was 50 total. What what I do remember is that when we started, 15 of the positions were totally vacant with no one in the positions. And so I knew for a fact of the 62, 15 were vacant. And then we started working to fill some of them with civilians. But as as the DC said, some of them are are being cross-trained so that we can, that there you. can be a seamless transition. So it'd be safe to assume that 15 of those 62, once those positions started to get filled, they were only filled with civilians. That's correct. Not, okay. Exactly. So Chief Gillis, you know me well enough. Can you, can you give me the whole breakdown of that 62 and we, we can chat later yes, on the phone. Yes, absolutely. But, okay, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, please continue. So we've completed the first draft of the staffing plan which went through the first round of public comment a few weeks ago and is entering its second round of public comment today that will go through the middle of February. And once the public comment periods have concluded, we'll work to incorporate feedback and provide answers from the department to all the recommendations in the report. Now this next slide outlines where we are with recruitment and attrition this year. And once again, we saw 190 sworn members leave the department in 2019. Again, it's actually the lowest separation rate we've seen in the past 10 years. So an 18% reduction with the attrition levels compared to 2018. In 2018, there was a net loss of 47 sworn members, but compared to 2019, we saw the number decrease to 33. So we need to work harder to attract more qualified applicants into the department, but our ability to reduce the rate of attrition represents an opportunity that we must take advantage of in 2020. We've received a state grant to further enhance our digital marketing and recruitment efforts. And we've reduced the amount of downtime at our academy scheduled so that we can complete training faster and begin new classes sooner. That downtime means we went once again from a 38 to 40 week academy now to a 30 week academy, thereby getting recruits to the field eight weeks faster than we used to a year ago. The Administrative Duties Division. I want to update you on the creation of our Administrative Duties Division, which is a centralized chain of command for all personnel who are on limited duty or long-term medical status. When we designed this effort, we identified 113 personnel who were distributed throughout the department and announced that effective in October, they will be transferred to the Administrative Duties Division and their overtime and secondary employment authorization would be significantly restricted. As of the last hearing, we had 54 limited duty personnel from that list that indicated they were available for full duty status. As of today, 89 members have returned to full duty. This result is outstanding and we will continue to actively manage these members so that we are ensuring they're staying on the path to getting better and healthier and returning to work as soon as possible. In future meetings, we will continue to provide update status on this program. With regards to technology, Technology is absolutely key to becoming more efficient, more effective, and then more accountable. I'm excited to report that we not only are continuing to make tremendous strides toward improving the way the department views and utilizes technology, but within the next several months, we will start implementing technology upgrades that will fundamentally change how the BPD functions. My chief technology officer, Woody Davis, is here if you wish to ask him any questions about specific projects but I wanna highlight a few of our most important efforts. The selection of a new records management system or an RMS contractor is imminent and we are on schedule to select the vendor to initiate implementation of the new RMS before July of this year. We've received state funding for additional license plate readers 
and we are working with our vendor on the best location to install them before July of 2020. We will continue maturing our IT governance, our change management, and technical review board processes to ensure all technology purchases, whether using grant funds or general funds, are done in line with the overall technology plan and help us achieve our overall department goals. In closing, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak about our efforts. I also want to thank the men and women of the Baltimore Police Department who make great sacrifices and do great work under extremely difficult circumstances. We are on a good path to increasing the capacity of our department to meet the needs of our officers so that they can focus on protecting the residents of the city. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Colleagues, any questions? Uh, Councilman Pinkett, then Burnett. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Just a quick question related to um, cop logic. Okay. Um, it looks like um, in the data that we received, um, we have uh, 1,866. Uh, reports handled, 551 rejected. Um, so I, I guess that's about 30% re rejection rate. Um, is there data, are there goals on what we anticipated being the rejection rate and how do we, how do we reduce that rejection rate? Councilman, that rejection rate could be a, a number of different things. Many times it is because what they are trying to report is a crime that requires an officer to respond to the scene, or they are reporting something that is not a crime, or they are reporting something that didn't occur in, in our jurisdiction, uh, or they don't have the information to be able to, to make the crime and, and they will call back and report again. So it's all those things that are in that bucket. Uh, so those are opportunities certainly for us to get better at it uh, and make sure we educate it. I think we talked about that the last time. Yeah. Uh, and, and we continue and we will share stuff with, with council members to push out uh, to make sure that there's a clear understanding about what can be reported uh, through this cop logic, uh, through this reporting mechanism. And so what, um, what percentage um, of the reports that come through cop logic, what, I guess what percentage of the total reports that we receive that would, that would be the types of reports that, that we should be directing towards cop logic? And I think that it, it uh, on this slide right here, it talks about the different uh, things that that can be uh, reported: Correct. larceny uh -huh. from vehicle, larceny other, legal dumping, uh, destruction of property, and lost property. Uh, so, how many total reports do we have in those six categories? I, I think uh, we 1,866. No, I mean that that have been reported by other means. Oh, I, I'll get that number for you and. and Provide. Because and, and the only reason I'm asking is because we're looking at the savings associated with the use of cop logic. Um, the, the only way to increase those savings is to make certain that we drive more people towards cop logic. And so there should be a goal associated with the numbers, the percentage of those total reports that are being handled by cop logic. And it should be something that we, not only, well, the department is going, but we as a city, there should be some motivation if we can show citizens that, hey, you know, the, the more we use this system, you know, the more money that we save for the city to be able to utilize or, or to be able to support other activities. But if we don't know what that number is and we don't have a goal, internal goal, then it'd be difficult you know, to sell that message. I would say the goal is all of the, the nonviolent crimes that are usually property crimes and nuisance offenses that don't require a police response could be either through an online web-based reporting or telephonic reporting for those who don't have access or the savviness to do it. Um, the goal is to, to get us to a point where we can build the free time by minimizing police responses back into the officer's patrol, uh, you know, the, the patrol deployment strategy. I would say we, the goal is to get as many as possible of all of those crimes into either telephone or electronic reporting. Um, my, my last question is, based upon the, the, the numbers of office, sworn officers that we currently have, um, is, is 206, I know that was the, the, the number of vacancies, but is that the number that you as the commissioner of the department feel um, positions need to be filled in order to um, eff um, effectively you know, um, move forward with your plan, your strategy? It's, it's that number 
plus more. And the, uh, what we know is that the staffing plan will have recommendations for additional hires to the sworn number. And so the 206 vacancies is only based on the budget strength of 2661 minus the people who are not here. And then the, there will be recommendations to say we need X number beyond the 206 to and bring us to another the, what, total. What, what's that number? It, it's out for public comment now. There are, some, there are some adjustments and calculations we had to make working with the staffing consultant. That number would be an extra 150 plus beyond the 206. Right, because, and, yes. and so let's, let's say, you know, 350, 400. I mean, it's, yeah. that, that's a ballpark figure, yes. Because the reality is, based upon even the current um, you know, numbers, you know, based upon the attrition and recruitment that we're currently seeing in the police department, the chances of us reaching 400 um, is decades out. And so our, our plan has to account for that um, the reality that we there might not be 400 officers coming through the door, and um, so just I know you know. Thank you. That's that's the goal. That's the goal. Those are the goals we're working for to increase. That's why we're working to increase the number of applicants, successful applicants that come through the door as new recruits, retaining as many of our veteran personnel as we possibly can. This year was a. 2019, rather, was a better year than the previous nine years, F shaving off eight weeks of the academy and bringing officers to the field eight weeks sooner than we had been in previous years. All of those things are force multipliers that really working together all help us. Then the technology that comes online that frees up burdens, and as you stated, and we agree, moving more of the police responses to web-based reporting or telephone reporting, freeing up the responses to much of these property crimes. To the extent that we can do all of that, um, even we still need you know, several hundred more officers. But it frees up time, and it makes it at least somewhat easier for the officers to respond and have ample backup and, you know, for officer safety. Right. And, and, so, and, and part of the reason I say it is j just so that you know, even the listening audience and citizens of Baltimore don't operate under the illusion that we're going to get more officers. I mean, every city around the nation struggles with getting more officers. Yes. And so the reality, even professionals in law enforcement field recognize that, um, that sometimes it might not even, even though we, we keep saying we need more officers, it might not be just the fact that we need more officers. It's, it might be more important to find out what the officers are doing, you know, exactly. when you have them and being more efficient with that. And especially when we know that you know, we are recruiting officers at such a low rate and, and still have this attrition, we've just got to do better with what we have. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Burnett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just had a really quick question. Um, Mr. Commissioner, at the last hearing, uh, it was indicated that the license plate reader technology would be in uh, 15 locations by January 1. Um, you gave us a later date in your opening statement can you speak to sort of what the, the what is feeding that delay in um, yeah in in in, in, uh, in deployment? Take that. Yeah. Thank you. Before before our chief technology talks about the deployment, part of it was a delay in the state funding being authorized until toward the end of December. So that was a big part of it. But he could speak towards the deployment strategy. Actually, that that was the number one contributing factor to. Um, to the delay. We've identified the 15 locations. Um, we've gone back and reassessed the 15 locations and found that we may be able to um, improve on a few of those locations. We've already, we're working with our contractor um, adjusting those locations. So uh, this timeline adjustment really is based on the funding, um, but we're, we're aggressively moving forward and um, we're doing what we call rebaselining the timeline and uh, we should be able to be prepared to give you a more accurate timeline um, next time we meet. You're welcome. So the state funding was released? In December, that is correct. But we're not going to have them deployed until July 1? The, deploy, the deployment is a, uh, a process over a period of time. By that time frame, they all should be deployed. OK. Can we, can we dig in a little deeper on the schedule then? When, when's the first one uh, that, set? To 
that's the schedule that we'll bring, as I mentioned, um, at the next meeting. We'll have we'll be better prepared to give you a more detailed a detailed schedule at that at that time. Okay. Um, recognizing you don't have the schedule and you're going to provide it in advance of next month, and I would ask that you provide that by next Friday. Um, I'd still like to talk about that a little bit just to better understand the the challenges with with sure. associated with deploying the technology if. I can only assume that because this was planned to be deployed by January 1 and recognizing you couldn't deploy it because of the state funding challenges, I have to assume that the department was prepared to deploy it on January 1 from a procurement perspective, save for the fact that you didn't have the money, right? So you knew what devices you were going to buy, who you were going to buy them from, how all that was going to work, correct? We knew the devices who we're purchasing from. Um, the acquisition process um, is a lengthy process um, that directly impacts us. Without the release of funds, um, we cannot purchase the equipment. And so that is the, that's what directly impacts our timeline. From a schedule perspective, it's adjusting the schedules. And as I mentioned, there are a few sites that we found that we can improve on. So we've gone back to the contractor, which means that they have to come back to the site, reassess the site, provide us um, an updated recommendation based on the new locations of the site. So that's why I say um, by our next meeting, I will be prepared to provide a more detailed schedule on which will give you a real timeline as to when we'll deploy the LPRs okay. for our fixed site locations. And that acquisition project or process that you're talking about, mm -hmm. is that governed by BPD or city procurement? City procurement. Bob, can you speak? to that at all so no that that shop is not um, in our office oh, I know it's I can, not I yeah, just I can, know you know more about procurement than probably anyone yeah in the room I mean generally the budget they, director yeah, so. agency puts in a puts in a requisition they put it out for bid so I can find out a little bit more detail about the timing of this particular item um, but generally it has to go out for bid the bids have to come in they have to be reviewed by a committee and then the award is made at the Board of Estimates so depending on the complexity of it that can take anywhere from Know, a few weeks to months so we can find out the details on this one and this isn't sole source I don't know I'd have to check on that I don't I do not know if it's sole source so one of the things I think we might look at is if these are on state contract if that's the case we could piggyback off of that and expedite some of the procurement issues but <coughs> because these are the same state these are the same license plate readers that state police is using and has procured through an open and competitive process so there are ways to leverage that but again Part of that is going through the process and identifying not necessarily a sole source, but something that's been competitively bid on state contract that we could then piggyback from. Okay, got it. So okay. I'm looking forward to having that conversation as well as receiving your response by next Friday. I, I am certainly not, I want to be clear that I'm not placing blame. I'm not um, coming to any conclusions because we don't have all the information in front of us right now to have the full discussion. That being said, uh, one other thing I'll note that when you say they will all be deployed by July 1, I can only assume that that means you're not deploying all of them on June 30th, like that day. So I imagine you have a, a, a schedule, a, a tiered schedule. Um, but I just want to forewarn that I'm going to be extremely frustrated if these all are not getting deployed until the month of June because of procurement issues. Um, there is no, I, I'm not going to be on a soapbox up here, there's no bigger priority in the city right now than public safety. So whatever we need to do with procurement to like kick them in the backside to get them to move, to get this stuff deployed needs to be happening as quickly as humanly possible with the greatest sense of urgency. Yeah, but even, sounds, uh, like, it, sounds like with the, if it is a piggyback off the state contract that typically helps because it's already available and we just piggyback off of that one. So. Um, that that could help, but this particular one I'm not involved in. But we can touch base on what the best okay. way to get. Okay, and you already we'll have the, and you already have the schedule prepared and all that, right? We we have we have a not a detailed schedule completed, uh, mainly because uh, the contractors who have to evaluate the locations are the ones that helping us drive the schedule. So they're still assessing a couple more sites. So as I mentioned. We should have the detailed schedule by the time we okay. meet again. So when you ask me to have you something, have something to you by Friday, I'm not sure what condition I can give you something by Friday because it, we have a dependency on our contractors. So we're dependent. Okay, great. So you got it. The heart. I of think it. there's a third part 
to that. Even though we're dependent on the vendor, the vendor and the city are dependent on the installer. Correct. Is, is, there, is there a third person to do installation? Um, I'd have to check on that, sir. Um, I'm not sure if the same the electric, the, provider the city's of electrical the, provider. Right. I have to check on that. So yeah, just, just to be clear, there are infrastructure needs that may also exist. So it's not just the camera itself, but it's the fiber optics and everything else that needs to connect with the camera to ensure that it's provided to the city. So part of that site assessment is what identifies those needs. And again, we're, we're leveraging every contract that we have that's already open to be able to create those infrastructure improvements. And the resources we have just have to be planned out, budgeted, and then put on schedule. And we're trying to get to as many as possible. So personal experience, I helped run some of these things in New Orleans myself, and to deploy what was effectively 47 locations, it took, a, took about three to four months just to kind of get everything in a phased approach where they would do like one or two a day, but that was a very aggressive schedule. So even something like that for 47 locations was very difficult for us to deploy in a short time period, but we were able to get it done. We were able to leverage state contracts and be able to, again, as you say, move with all due haste. Just for awareness, there, we, then there was the city electrical provider that, this, that the vendor and the city was relying on to get that work done. So I think there may be some of that that exists also, just for awareness. Yeah, I just want to make sure that, that we're not sitting around we're not, waiting yes. on a vendor um, because we have um, too many vendors in the city that we do business with that don't seem to have the same sense of urgency that we have. So I'm, I'm comforted knowing that everyone in this room shares my same sense of urgency with getting this deployed. So I think anything you can do, like if you could go back to your vendors tomorrow and tell them I got yelled at by the city council and that you know I'm gonna continue to get yelled at, which is making me not feel good or whatever it is that you need to say to them, that would be greatly appreciated. Will do. They're watching now, yes. Okay. And just, I'll just add one little piece to this. It is, there, this has many complexities. You know, there's a lot of piece, moving parts just to place one LPR in a location. And so that coordination is, is really what we're working through. That's why um, when I say we'll give you a detailed schedule, it's really about coordinating, which we are doing. That's the, we're not sitting on our hands. We're, we're act, actively engaged in, with our vendors, which are multiple vendors, um, to ensure that we can get this self-imposed timeline uh, of July okay. to have them in deployed. And we'd be glad to talk to you after this and keep you abreast throughout the process as well. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I appreciate it. Um, colleagues, any other questions before I ask more? Councilwoman McCray. So I see that for the application, on the application section, I see that the office's application is 28%. Um, they say they live in the city. Um, for the cadet side, the applications, it was 53%. When I look at the, who we hired for the offices, it's pretty close, it's 26%. Can you speak to the challenges to why the hires on the cadet side dropped drop to 26% from 53%? Like that's a large number compared to the offices we hired. So can you just explain to me what the challenges are on that cadet side that we couldn't get more cadets who live in the city hired. Yeah, great point. You know, we, we struggle with cadets and recruits um, hiring and then even more of a challenge, the number who actually live in the city. That's what the digital marketing campaign was all about, to target the individuals who live in the city and in, in, in this close region to become members of this police department, whether cadets who are under the age of 21 and not yet eligible to be a police officer or a recruit or a person who is 21 or older eligible to be a recruit. And then it becomes, you know, as we, as we look at the applications that come in, it's, it is still the same pass-fail rate. It's about two and a half to three percent pass-fail rate from application to hire to become a police officer. And then just the follow-through for the cadets who are between, you know, usually between 18 and 21, it becomes challenging to get them to be members of our cadet program. And we're working diligently to find uh, innovative ways to reach them in high schools and colleges, job fairs. I'll let the DC speak more and about And I'll it. just add one other thing to what the commissioner was saying with regard to cadets. If you think about the age group, as the commissioner said, it's folks coming out of high school. And so they are looking for a lot of things to do. It's not just this one career path. And so I think that some of the 
the difference can be attributed that they are picking other paths as they get, you know, they're applying for things and then getting selected for other things and then choosing not to go this way. I do think also to the commissioner's point about what he said about the marketing campaign and just generally speaking about what we're doing as an agency and a city and attracting more people to become officers, we can do more to focus on the cadets. We've been hyper-focused on the cops, on the police officers themselves, and we need to focus more on the younger folks as well, so. I guess I'm, tr I guess I'm trying to figure out what's the challenge. I get us the age group, but where are they dropping off at that significant rate from 53% to 26%? You said something about the paths, but is there anything else that you guys can speak of that you know of that's that reason that they're not getting hired at even close to that rate? Going through the background process is also a, a significant uh, hurdle as well. And so I think that we can find not even just creative ways, but just regular ways to help educate younger people about, and that's part of, we actually met with our our, our the company that's helping, helping us with the marketing campaign today to help go into high schools again and educate the kids who might apply to choose this career path to help them understand the decisions that they make at a young age that we all do as kids can really affect your career path to become a law enforcement officer. Things that people don't think about and it doesn't affect you for other career paths but it does to become a police officer. And so educating young people at a younger age will help them make smarter decisions to follow that path all the way to hire as an actual police officer. And so that's part of what the marketing campaign is addressing as well. Um, Commissioner, the, there was $118,000 in overtime worked for special events, pay period ending January 4th. My assumption is that's mostly New Year's Eve related. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, the. Uh, public commenting period for the staffing schedule. Can you walk us through that at a high level? I think you mentioned phase one is completed. We just started phase two, right? Yes. You said the staffing plan or community policing plan? Uh, staffing plan. Okay. Uh, phase two of the public comment period for the staffing plan starts today, um, and the department is uh, compiling. They've been, we've been compiling all of this feedback and uh, it is factoring into how we are responding to the recommendations of the staffing plan. So we'll continue to accept feedback from the public and uh, factor that into our decision making on how to proceed with the finalized staffing plan. Uh, the second public comment period will uh, be open for the next two or so weeks. Okay, and then what happens after, so the public comment period will end mid-February, then what's next? At that point, we will publish a finalized staffing plan, which will include our response to the recommendations in the plan uh, with a path forward for implementing the plan. Okay, and when is publication of that expected? Uh, I can get you the date on that shortly. Okay, plus or my, like March, the summer? I would say that's within the next month and a half. Next yeah. month, okay, all right, great. Um, the, uh, the comments from Judge Bradar regarding recruiting were extremely concerning. Um, can you address that in a little more detail? And, and I know that you're doing everything you can on the recruiting front, um, but you know we got to do he, more. And he, the judge, was concerned, as was I, as I'm certain all of all of us are. Um, and you know, you know, I express my commitment to making sure that we have a robust process and we do everything we can to bring as many people in without compromising the quality of the candidate to make sure we have the people who have the, the, the right will, capacity, and temperament to be police officers, more particularly Baltimore police officers. Um, and at the same time, working on retention. And so retention and recruiting actually go hand in hand. Uh, and the messaging and communications strategy about how we sell our department and message to people that this is a great place to come and a great place to stay. Those are all the things we're working on. And so, yeah, we are all very concerned. We're working to get more funding. We've gotten more funding, rather, from our, uh, for our digital marketing campaign so we can make it more robust. The applications have spiked again. Um, it is always a, a management challenge to make sure that we have um, the right number or adequate number of 
investigators who are police officers working in the recruitment section without compromising patrol and without compromising other investigative units. And so it is always that balance also with having the right amount of instructors at the academy. And so it is always a balanced approach that as we bring people on, we actually have the capacity to teach them. And that we, though we want to bring more people on faster, we want to make sure we actually have the capacity to house them and teach them and train them and have the vehicles to put them in with field training officers. All of those actually go hand in hand with recruiting because as we look at staffing, every, every time we get a, a class that graduates the academy and then finishes field training, we use that number to supplement promotions, to, to backfill pr empty vacancies through promotions, to backfill empty positions that are in specialized detective assignments, and then to add to patrol. Those detective assignments include recruiting and you know so we have to make sure we're giving them the right amount of staffing and equipment to make sure that we can work those background investigations and bring them in but those are all management decisions that we make and that we'll have to probably increase that staffing in the very near future uh, but it's also making sure that the people who are applying that we're staying in contact with them we used the concierge approach to with civilians who are working there to stay in touch with them so that we can stay ahead of the competition Good. Um, can you give me an update on the auxiliary, please? I know there was a class that was supposed to start in January. Yes, they're, they're still working along with the, the, the consent decree to get the, make sure everything is um, certified before we get the next class started. And that's the policy that needs? Yes. Okay. What's the timing for that? Um, I'm not sure. Do you know, D.C.? No, I mean, I don't, I think we need to push forward on that. I mean, that's not a, um, we can discuss the policy with DOJ and the monitors. I mean, it's, it's really just about moving forward with that program. So can we expedite having that discussion on the auxiliary? Yes. Place? This is something I ask about every, every month. I'd like I'll to get with Colonel Brown, Lieutenant it's Colonel a, Brown. It's a, it's a training component that has to be built and then approved by DOJ as well. Okay. Um, my last question is for Bob. Um, do we know, um, I haven't heard anything recently on the public safety officer's real property tax credit that I sponsored a few years ago. Do we know how many um, BPD office, sworn officers are taking advantage of that? I don't expect you to know that off the top. Uh, of your we, we do have the numbers we've looked at. I don't have it with me, but we can send you an update. Um, we did do some uh, a deep dive this year because this was the first full year, I believe, that we had the program. So mm -hmm. uh, we can send you the results of what we found. Please, um, Commissioner, is that program something that we could have? I imagine there's email blasts that go out to the department yes. related to certain things, health and wellness, retention, et cetera. Can we start to include that on a regular basis? We absolutely can. As a matter of fact, we the mayor and I mention it at every recruit class. Mm -hmm. that comes in on day one and we mention at every graduation class when we uh, have graduation ceremonies but we can certainly send it out to the to the masses in the police department to keep them updated on what this is and how it's beneficial for us yeah I feel like once someone starts to utilize that credit it makes the decision a little more difficult uh, to separate from the department so um, absolutely something we can do and will do colleagues any other questions Commissioner, thank you, uh, thank you, everyone from the police department who's here. Um, thank you to all the men and women who are working around the clock to help keep our city safe. Uh, and I uh, would like to give a public shout out to the, the Central District Action Team. Uh, is um, whatever you're doing there, you're doing correctly. And however you can figure out how to replicate that throughout your entire department, I would encourage you to look at what they're doing. Former Sergeant Rotel. Um, I was very concerned when he left. Sergeant Ostrander has stepped in uh, and has really uh, just been doing a fantastic job. There's nothing that pleases me more than when I get an email from an 80-year-old woman in Druid Heights that tells me that she can finally enjoy sitting on her stoop. Um, I got a few of those emails um, uh, over on Robert Street and, and McCullough and Druid Hill the other day, and I'm just so pleased to see that. So whatever you can do to replicate that, please thank do. Thank you for that, and please tell her that we say thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we're now in recess.